So, Brian, what I'd like to do is to talk about some of the issues which are generally discussed over a pint in the bar or in various corners of people's rooms in Southside and get something of your opinion on the problems of student life today. Mm. But to begin with, there is rather a burning issue of the moment, that's to say, Linstead Hall, or rather the Town Planning's Committee decision to reject IC's application for an extension to the hall. Now, I know you don't want to comment too much on this because, obviously, if you have a trump card, then you want to play it. But there are a couple of points I'd like to ask you, because you must have some sympathy with the local residents in Ennismore Gardens who say that having 20 or 25 per cent of the population of Knightsbridge in one small square in London is a bit much. Um, I don't have very much sympathy for two reasons. Uh, one is that I have always found that living amongst students is a perfectly easy thing to do. And I find that the students at Imperial College uh, especially are very well behaved on the whole. They make a bit of noise sometimes, enjoy themselves sometimes, but I don't find their behaviour objectionable, and therefore I don't at all mind living amongst them. And after all, I do live amongst them myself. But it's not only the students, it's the character of the building that they were planning to build. Well, yes, indeed, but uh, my second reason is that uh, Princess Gardens was uh, acquired for us by the government mm -hmm. uh, to put up halls of residence. Um, this was known at the time to everybody who lived around. Uh, the mews at, the, at, at that time were in very poor shape. Yes. Um, and the, the mews were improved by the people who then bought them, knowing that we were going to be putting up buildings of this general character. But if you look from the mews to Prince's Gardens, I mean, currently you can see Prince's Gardens. Yes, but you see, this is part of planning. You, you try to plan ahead how a certain area is going to be used. Mm -hmm. And if knowing the plans, you then do something that contradicts those plans, and you create a conflict. It's not and I would say that it's the Knightsbridge residents who, on the whole, have created the conflict rather than us, because they knew that we were going to put up buildings of this sort. I think it's not only the buildings, the fact that there are buildings, but the character of the buildings they're objecting to. Well, the character of the buildings are uh, suitable, I believe, for a traditional London square. That's to say, buildings of uh, seven to ten stories or so. Mm -hmm. uh, what some people are proposing is that we put up um, three or four story buildings in the form of rabbit hutches or something. Uh, that would be totally out of character with the London square. If that's what the new planning authorities wish us to do, or if a body like the uh, Fine Arts Commission wished us to do that, uh, then we could consider it. But the buildings we've been proposing have been entirely in line with what the Westminster City Council planners have themselves advised us was the sort of thing we should be thinking of. You've mentioned the Knightsbridge Residents Association. Now, the Knightsbridge Residents Association lobbied Westminster City Council extensively. Yes. Did we? No, we didn't. Why not? We didn't because we are a public body. Yes. Uh, and it is improper for a public body to lobby representatives of uh, local residents or members of parliament. Would it have been proper for the union to, to lobby Westminster City Council on I this? would have said that it would have been undesirable, mm -hmm. uh, but not actually perhaps improper. Undesirable because it could be felt that the union were in some way representing the college. Well, that's right. As an organ of the college, uh, I would have thought it was undesirable. But of course, the Knightsbridge Association uh, met with us. Mm -hmm. The Knightsbridge uh, Residents Association met with us. Yes. And uh, they could undoubtedly have met with the students at any time had they so wished. Yes, this is another accusation that's been made that the Knightsbridge Residents Association never met with the students. Well, they only had to ask them. I'm sure that uh, the various presidents of the union we've had over the last few years we would have been only too glad to arrange an expedition. They've also accused the Felix article that was written last Friday of being slightly biased. Have you read it yourself? Yes, I have. Did you feel that it was in any way unfair? Unfair to whom? Unfair to the Knightsbridge residents. No, not at all. I see. As a matter of interest, are you, are you yourself a member of the Knightsbridge Residents Association? Because you do live in their area. Uh, well, technically, I don't think I do, but, uh, but no, I'm not anyway. No, you've I could belong. Yes, I think, I think uh, you're quite right. I could belong, but I don't. Have you considered joining? I have considered joining. I decided that uh, while the rather sensitive uh, negotiations were going on, mm -hmm. uh, my joining might seem uh, slightly peculiar, so I didn't. Can we leave the Lindstedt issue because, and move on to something else? There's the overseas students' problems. It's another issue which is bubbling. Yes. Uh, the overseas students can have had several problems recently, ever-increasing fees and a discriminatory fees structure. Do you approve of a discriminatory fees structure for overseas students? 
Between overseas stu students and home students? Correct, yes. Uh, no, I most certainly do not. I don't approve of uh, any discrimination between people on the grounds that they are foreign. I see, yes. Um, as such. But, um, uh, of course, what has been proposed by the Vice Chancellor's Committee and the University Grants Committee is that we change the system and instead discriminate between postgraduate students and undergraduate students. Discriminating between postgraduate students and undergraduate students, they will put off postgraduate students, won't it? Because it well, necessarily means yes. that postgraduate fees must be increased. Uh, yes, I'm afraid it's the choice between two evils, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the uh, evil of discriminating against people because they're foreign yes. um, is one that I'm not prepared to accept. Uh, the evil of having postgraduate uh, students slightly discouraged from coming because of the high level of fees um, is something that is, if necessary, acceptable. Would it matter if fewer postgraduate students came forward? Do you, do you think there are too many postgraduate students anyway? I think that there are somewhat too many. What's the criteria for deciding there are too many? I think one can judge uh, by the quality of the work done by the research students and the advanced course students that we have. So far as research students are concerned, one judges by the, the significance and the quality of the work they submit for their PhD. Mm -hmm. And I've been a PhD examiner uh, in many universities in my time, and I can tell you that I am quite clear that something like a third of the PhDs I have examined might just as well never have been written. In fact, it would have been better had they not been. Would you hold with those people who argue that PhD theses ought to have a more direct application than a lot do nowadays? Because not of the financial problems? Not necessarily, no. Not necessarily, no. If you're asking me whether I think that the uh, research work of universities should be somewhat more biased towards dealing with problems of fairly short-term national yes. uh, and industrial importance, uh, then the answer to that is yes. Because it has been argued that we should be directing our attention more to those aspects of research which have some direct application because we can no longer go, uh, go on affording. Uh, yes, but our task after before. all is partly to produce research results but even more important, perhaps, at this stage of PhD training, to train people who in the future will be able to solve problems of national importance. And you don't necessarily do that by being given an applied piece of work to do. Coming back to the overseas students' uh, affairs, there's currently a debate going on about the problem of overseas students' visas. It has been said that universities might be given the right to police university students from overseas and only have their visas renewed if they've been attending their courses regularly? Yes. Well, I think there is a small proportion of students who, uh, who use a university place as a device to get into the country and then live on social security or whatever it may be. Do you feel it right that the universities jobs, should be given this responsibility? Um, because you are being asked to be know, a police force. I don't know what the word police means, and I, I have not yet been asked to be a police force. But I, I do think it right that if we take students, they should be in a position to learn from us and work with us. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, they simply cannot speak English at all, right. uh, or if having come they do not attend the, their courses at all, or they don't do their research at all, or whatever it is, then they are clearly misusing us for I, their own purposes. This comes back to a, a similar thing uh, to do with finance. Do overseas students in these hard times have the right to come to the UK anymore in the numbers they have before? It's another debate which has been brewing underneath the storm. Well, I think this depends on your view of one's relations with other countries. But you would hold that there aren't too many students? In perhaps a legal sense, they don't have a right, in no. the sense that they can be turned away. But I think it is generally uh, accepted amongst uh, civilized countries, especially those of the West, that there should be free movement between countries especially for cultural purposes, but not only. And if universities do not fulfill cultural purposes, I don't know what to do. Because, of course, this is all very pertinent to IC, because we have so many students from overseas. Another yes. point... Uh, and may that long continue, as far as I'm concerned. Good. Tell me, there, were, there was a scheme last year to help overseas students who got into financial difficulties because yes. of fees increase. This was abolished. What's the position about it now? No, it's not been abolished. The point is that last year, um, many more students than had been expected got into financial difficulties 
uh, because the level of fees was changed after they were with us. Mm -hmm. And so they were unprepared for this change. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, we make quite clear that this is something that may happen. Fees may change after students reach us. And we warn them that this is the case. And the mere fact that the level of fee changes will not be a sufficient excuse for us to help them. But we have also always said that any student who gets into quite genuine difficulties, which are not of his own uh, doing, we will do our level best to help him in such a way that he won't have to leave before he's got the qualification that he came for. Could and I we shall continue to do that to the best of our abilities. May I ask you about the college's general relationship with the union? Because it should be the union who campaigns on issues such as these. Some colleges and universities have unions which are at constant loggerheads with, their, with the university authorities. Some are not. IC is one who is not. Why not? Is it because of some <coughs> general satisfaction in IC with the way things are running? Or is it because... It has not always been the case that um, IC Union has got on uh, very amicably uh, with the college authorities. Uh, but only for a very short time uh, was it like that. Uh, on the whole, relations have been good, friendly, and constructive in both directions. And this is something I believe that both sides should try to encourage. We can do a lot more trying to work together than we can confronting each other. But a lot of universities, Essex is a prime example, have large demonstrations. They have a history of rebellion in the university against the academic authority. This has never been the case at IC, has it? Never to that extent. That has never been the case, no, um, to anywhere near that extent. Um, I, I don't want to suppress uh, students who feel that some issue affects them so strongly that they really must demonstrate about it. If they feel Why like do you think that, students at Essex fine. feel that they must demonstrate against the university authority? I think probably for two reasons. One is that Essex was built in a way that I personally think is uh, not ideal. Namely, it's a place way out in the country, and then they go and put students quite unnecessary into tower blocks. Mm -hmm. So I think the design of the place itself is to some extent at fault. Uh, but also, of course, there is a large proportion of students who are studying um, uh, soft subjects, as many of us would say. Um, whereas at Imperial College, there's a very high proportion of students who are dedicated to some professional purpose, like becoming uh, a working scientist or, or uh, a working engineer or something of that kind. Students here, on the whole, are more serious about being in the university to learn and to qualify here uh, than they are in some universities, of which perhaps Essex is an example. And also because the university somehow represents the establishment, because they feel well, they yeah, rebel yeah, against yeah. establishment. Uh, yes, I think those students who feel the need to rebel against society in a generalized sort of fashion find it very difficult to get at society in any way, especially if they're out in the country. Mm -hmm. And so they turn to the nearest thing they have, which is the college administration, which they identify with, um, with the establishment or the government or something at large. Or is it because the university is seen to be a part of the establishment rather than just represented? Because the university is given money by the government and somehow, if you rebel against the university, you might feel that you're rebelling well, against the government. Well, people on the dole receive money from the government, but you don't usually think of them as the establishment. I don't know what the establishment is. I suppose I'm a member of it myself. I'm always being accused of being, so I must be. Um, all I would say is that, that in the absence of anyone else, the college authorities or the university authorities are a convenient bunch of people to throw things at, and that, I suppose, is why they're picked on. But it is rather foolish. Um, because only too often the university authorities, if dealt with more sympathetically, and it's sometimes their fault yes. that they're not, of course, I would be the first to acknowledge that, would be their allies. Of course, this, all this links up with the public attitude to students, because the public Im <coughs> image of a student is bad. I think you'd agree. I mean, somehow the public image of a student is somebody who perhaps lays about, and it's not, it's not one of scholarship and learning, as perhaps it was at one time. Would you agree? I would agree that the public image of a student went through a low point uh, some years ago, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, six, seven, eight years ago, and that we have not fully recovered from that yet. But um, I think we're way beyond that low point, and I think public understanding of uh, students is going up. Um, I'm pretty sure that students uh, here are regarded quite reasonably 
by, the, by most of the surrounding population do you as think people they realize are dedicated and are sensible and of course enjoy themselves but in a nice way. Prior to 1968, which is when the student image started to go down, what with the riots, yes. general uprising all over the world, do you think the image of a student was bad before? Or was it young people generally? I'm not clear what all the things were. I mean, some of the things, uh, undoubtedly uh, abroad, certainly, arose from extremely bad university arrangements. I mean, uh, wildly overswollen classes. Mm -hmm. You may compla complain at, uh, at a, a staff-student ratio of one to eight or something, but I mean, uh, in some universities, they are one to a hundred, you see. And uh, the chance of staff interacting with students is almost nil. So that is where the trouble started mostly, and cramped accommodation, bad living accommodation, all this sort of thing. Uh, and it spread rapidly, uh, partly aided by chaps like you with, with uh, television studios who, who went out and called it news. Well, I hope we don't call that Well, I didn't mean news. you, I meant the national media. Yes. Uh, which undoubtedly generated uh, a student movement which was founded upon something that I believe to have been justified. But uh, it spread into a much more generalized attack upon the nature of society as a whole and authority as a whole, and then I think it started to get rather silly. Do you think that universities where student trouble is inherent are self-perpetuating in a way? Because if you have uh, a university with a lot of politicos in it, then you'll get more politicos. Yes, I, I certainly reputation. think there are cycles of that sort. Uh, on the other hand, the opposite also applies. I'm sure that um, a lot of people come to Imperial College rather than somewhere else uh, because they know that uh, staff-student relations and that sort of thing here are on the whole not bad. I see. If we can turn back to the union in college, um, meetings of UGMs, union general meetings, are very badly attended. Yes, I know. Do you think this somehow links up with what we were saying before about uh, a general satisfaction perhaps? Well, it's well known that you get many more people to a meeting if it's a protest meeting uh, on an issue that's a hot issue uh, than if you just have a sort of routine meeting uh, dealing with ordinary business. Do you think it's an explanation for why the relationship between the college and the union is so good that the fundamental base of the union is weak, the UGM? That very few people go to UGMs, so the union doesn't have any teeth. It could be so, but I don't think so, because... Um, well, I don't pretend to meet every student. There are far too many for me to be able to do so. But I do my best to meet as many as I can and to chat with them. And I don't detect uh, a great underswell of dissatisfaction and discontent uh, that is just about to burst out or anything of that sort. Every president who comes to Imperial College Union vows to increase attendance at UGMs and never succeeds. Would you um, support him in those attempts? Yes, most certainly, and I have done so, and uh, in my uh, welcoming speeches to students at, uh, on the first day of term, I make quite clear that I believe in a strong and representative union, and that can only be the case if as many people as possible take part in its activities, including turning up, turning up to rather boring meetings sometimes. Now, if we could turn to some of the issues in the union. Uh, firstly, sabbatical officers. Now, I know it may be a bit unfair, because it's only this morning that you had the yeah. policy document about uh, the union's new sabbatical officer. But basically, the union want another sabbatical officer, somebody called the Vice President's Buildings Finance, to replace the Deputy President. Do you agree with this? Do you think it's a good idea to have more sabbatical officers in principle? Well, I'm not going to say whether I agree with it or not, because I haven't read the case. No, but in general. What I said to Nick Brayshaw when he asked me um, about uh, the way to make a case for it was that I, I, I said that um, uh, Vice Chancellors generally were rather lukewarm towards increasing the number of sabbatical officers on, on general grounds. Uh, some places have far too many already. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would say that of Imperial College, but some places do. Uh, and the thing was beginning to run away. And we felt that, at any rate, a pause on the creation of new sabbatical posts was highly called for. In what way does uh, having more sabbatical officers run but away? If I might just add uh, a yes. point, I also said to Nick that um, in times of financial hardship, which we are undoubtedly going to face over the mm -hmm. next few years, undoubtedly, um, it will be necessary to show 
that any new thing we can do, we can still contain within a reduced budget. A sabbatical so officer's I asked him to I show uh, cost effectiveness yes. of a sabbatical post. And he tells me that that's what this document, which I have yet to read, will do. It's cheaper than uh, will do. paid staff. And if it does that, then that is something which uh, could, in principle, dispose at least of the financial aspect of the problem. Having another sabbatical officer is cheaper than having paid staff, isn't it? Uh, that is correct, but it isn't cheaper than having part-time officers, and one has to be convinced that uh, the job cannot be done by part-time officers, perhaps more than one. One sabbatical which the union was considering recommending at one time was welfare, which is an interesting point, because currently welfare in the college is somewhat college-dominated, isn't it? Do you think it's the college's responsibility or the union's responsibility to provide welfare? Welfare taken in the broadest sense, student counsellors, nursery facilities, people along the lines of John Morgan, the current welfare officer. The last thing I'd want to do is to sound paternalistic about this. Yes. Uh, uh, partly beca because I believe that unions have a very important um, part to play in the welfare life of the college anyway, uh, and should be encouraged to take part in as many activities running student affairs as they, as they possibly can. On the other hand, I do think that w many welfare matters are matters for e professionals, for experts. And insofar, I mean, obviously health matters are. Yes. Um, inso and legal matters are. And insofar as that is the case, it probably is better if the college provides it. But um, we would always try to ensure that whatever arrangements we set up um, as a college uh, were set up with the full participation and concurrence of the students as represented through the union. Do you think students would be more prepared to go to a union office rather than a college office, paid or not? I don't see why, uh, why that should be so if we choose the right sort of people. I mean, after all, the students surely wouldn't prefer to go to a, to a union-appointed doctor or psychiatrist than to a college doctor or psychiatrist, would they? I, I don't hope know, not, but if, because if, it's the quality of the medical advice that But, matters. for example, if you're talking to somebody who's a student, this is often more valuable than talking to somebody who's uh, employed by the college. On some things, yes. The college consists of successful things, yes. students. But on, on other things, it may appear to be the case. But where genuine experience uh, and expertise is required, I think it can be dangerous to go to an amateur, particularly, if I may say so, an inexperienced amateur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Imperial College Union is, of course, um, the local union, but there are at least three other unions who this college should be negotiating with, notably ULU, University of London Union, National Union of Students, and the London Students' Organisation. As a matter of interest, how much contact do you have with these organisations? Well, as a member of the Vice-Chancellor's Committee, I have some contact with the NUS because I sometimes find myself sitting on a, uh, one side of the... Uh, table in a joint discussion between the two bodies. Um, uh, I don't have that kind of relationship very often with Yulu. No. And I learnt most of what little I know about Yulu from Trevor Phillips shortly after he left here to go there. But I mean, when so was the, last the answer is not very much. No, but when was the last time you spoke to or someone spoke to you from the NUS, for example? When was the last time somebody from the NUS Nobody you has up? ever spoken to me personally from the NUS. Do you think they should? As far as I can remember. Don't you think they should? Um, because, I mean, they campaign theoretically on our behalf. Well, but they, yes, I know, but their proper level of, um, of discussion with us is through the Vice Chancellor's Committee. And that's where I said I met them. And they are in constant touch with the Vice Chancellor's Committee. And I think that's the proper way it should be done. Um, the people who should ring me up are Nick Brayshaw and co, and they do. Good. Tell me, um, do you have any general opinion of people who are sort of long-term politicians in the NUS? For example, we had a discussion ourselves recently about the NUS here, and one of the participants was in his early 30s. Do you feel that this is a very good thing to happen? No, I don't. Um, I don't think it is a very good thing, and this is why I'm a little bit leery about too many sabbatical officers also, that I think it's a bad thing if a body like a student's union gets too much in the hands of those who are dedicated to keeping a job in it. Because you do get people who go from sabbatical to sabbatical to sabbatical. That's right, and we have certain rules that try to prevent that, of course. Yes. 
but uh, I also am worried when I see somebody who looks uh, well over 25 uh, and sometimes over 30 uh, sitting as a student's representative. If he has been doing that sort of thing for a long time, then he is not a student, and I doubt whether he can represent student interests properly. He can serve them as an officer, but I don't believe that he can serve them as a representative anymore. There are certain issues, very poignant issues, which are very pertinent to students in general. Things like maintenance, and refectory prices, and the halls of residence. Yeah. We heard a lot about these last <coughs> year. We haven't heard so much this year. Could you just briefly state what your position is on maintenance grants? for example? Well, my position is uh, the same as it was last year, that I believe that the maintenance grant is too low by more than £100 per annum. How can the college campaign at all, if they can? I don't think a campaign at the present time would have any value. Uh, this country is facing a much worse problem uh, about its general economic state, which is going down and down, and must do so for a short at least a further f few years. Uh, and I think to campaign on behalf of one particular group at the moment, when there is so much control over uh, wages and, and to, certain, to a lesser extent prices, uh, would be counterproductive. But to take part in properly constituted discussions about what the level of maintenance grants should be is quite another matter. And that, I can assure you, I do. But I mean, for example, last year we heard a lot about refectories. There was a big campaign in the yes. union about it. We haven't heard anything about this this year. Is this because the problem's been solved, do you think? Well, you know that last year we set up a, a new organization, um, which is gradually taking shape under the domestic secretary. And I have had it from just too many um, mouths to be able to ignore. Uh, that there is uh, undoubtedly have taken place many improvements in the refectories mm -hmm. uh, since this new organization got going. Uh, I'm quite sure also that there are many more improvements that have yet to take place. What I'm going to be most interested in uh, around about the middle of next term is uh, how students then feel about the running of the refectories. Uh, I hope they will feel that they're considerably improved. Can I change horses slightly and ask you how do you think IC suffers from being science-based? Because you've had experience of Cambridge, you've had experience of Manchester, you've been at Birmingham, and now you're at IC. None of the other three institutions are science-based, are they? No. I think uh, there are some disadvantages. Um, on the other hand, the disadvantages can be exaggerated. I mean, for example, Manchester is a very big university, mm -hmm. and uh, although I did mix up uh, with people from other faculties, and some of my close friends were from the faculties of medicine and arts and so on, and economics. Um, nevertheless, I think at the uh, lecturer level, for example, I was a professor then, but at the lecturer level, one mi mixes up much less than, than you would imagine. And uh, perhaps one makes most of one's contacts with other disciplines through living close to people from other faculties rather than from working close to them. But it does make for a very narrow intellectual base. So, yes, I'm only saying it can be exaggerated, however. There is not all that much contact in a, a big university. You wouldn't put down any of this, what we've been talking about, lack of attendance at union general meetings, good relationships between the, uh, between the students and the college, down to the fact that the college is fundamentally scientist. Um, I don't think so, no. But uh, it is well known, of course, that I believe that the intellectual base uh, even for professional purposes, let alone for cultural purposes, of Imperial College is too narrow. We hear a lot of the word apathy at Imperial College, yes. don't we? Yes. Do you think IC is apathetic in the most general possible terms? I think it's apathetic in uh, two different senses. I mean, one is the students don't turn up to, uh, to union meetings. Yes. Uh, in that sense, perhaps there's apathy. The other sen sense in which there is apathy is perhaps in the sense that we teach engineers how to solve certain problems, how to do certain things. We are only just beginning to teach them why they should be thinking about those problems rather than other problems uh, anyway, in the first place. And that undoubtedly gives the appearance of apathy. So uh, when I talk about uh, widening the intellectual basis of the college, what I mean is getting our professional professionally oriented people, whether scientists or engineers, to address themselves to the question of 
what we should be doing this as all, well as how we This should all links up with things like associated studies, because I know you're very much in favour of associated studies. But how successful are they? Because although some departments cater for a wide range of associated studies, in electrical yes. engineering you can, do, you can do languages, other departments, my own included, don't have or have very little facilities for associated studies at all. Yes. Well, uh, it, it is variable. Uh, that's to say the, the use made of associated studies by different departments. But, you know, this is a, a reasonably democratic place and, yes. and different departments uh, have their own styles and go about things differently and some believe in certain things and others don't. Um, what I believe is a pity, a great pity, is that there are some departments who are making very little use indeed of the language facilities. Yes. And I think their students will inevitably be penalized to some extent. I don't want to exaggerate it. Especially now that we have entered Europe and have to be part of Europe if we are to recover from our economic plight. So you're plight. generally critical of those departments who don't So in make general use. terms, mentioning no names, yes. I am critical of those student, uh, those um, departments who do not encourage their students to, to learn European languages. Another subject that interests me on, the, on a similar line is the teaching methods we have because very much at IC we have a bench, we have the lecturer on one side and we have the students lined up in rows the other. And then there's not much mixture, there's not much, they don't mix very much do they? We have something called a study group which in some departments is as much as 20 people in a room. Again there's not much opportunity for mixing then. No, again there are different styles in different departments and different lecturers have different styles, and we try to encourage differences. But do staff and students mix enough? Um, well, I think the formal lecture has its place. Mm -hmm. uh, it is undoubtedly the occasion when you can attempt to interest a large body of students in the subject. And perhaps it can be done better that way, especially with a few visual aids to show experiments that are difficult to perform, uh, you know, uh, in front of your very eyes. But. Uh, that, if, if it were left to formal lecturing of that sort, that would be nothing like sufficient. Because the only time I met a couple of lecturers in my department, I, I seem to remember, was at your very own Beer and Bangers, which we went to. Yes. And I don't think I've met them at any other time. Well, that's the opposite end of the spectrum from the formal lecture, I suppose, Beer and Bangers party. Quite, yes. Uh, it has its own point, I hope, because we, uh, we give several each year, um, and shall continue to do so as long as uh, they're attended well, as they are. But uh, there are all sorts of intermediate things, like study groups, um, tutorials, and all this kind of thing. And um, without wishing to, to uh, find a rigid way of going about it, we try to encourage people to experiment in different uh, ways of, of generating staff-student contacts. And I hope experiments will go on. I hope they will develop into much closer relationships. If I could turn to you personally, actually, because you've been at IC now for three years. <coughs> you were at Cambridge during the war, in fact. Yes. Do you think students enjoy themselves as much now as they did when you were a student? You know, it's terribly difficult to uh, compare um, London with Cambridge anyway, and to compare London in 1976 with Cambridge in the height of the war mm -hmm. uh, is even more difficult, and I'm not sure any comparisons I make would really be justified. Living in Cambridge is an extremely pleasant thing to do. Working in Cambridge can be extremely rewarding. It can be extremely frustrating, or in any rate, at any rate, in my day, it could be, because the line there, on the whole, was throw the chap in at the deep end, and uh, if he reaches the other, we'll we'll help him. But if he doesn't, that's too bad. You that, often that's an exaggeration, but that was more or less the system. It was. But you often swim. hear people who sort of reminisce and say, oh, "It was much better in my day." Uh, Students had much more fun. Yes, and I always leave Cambridge uh, when I go there, which I do frequently with tears in my eyes. But at the same time, um, I would uh, wish I could pass a law saying that nobody, everybody should spend at least two years in Cambridge, but nobody should spend more than five without a very considerable break in between. Because there is undoubtedly a sort of unreal air uh, about people who have spent all their lives from the end of their school days to the beginning of their death days uh, in, in Cambridge, completely cut off from outside society. Were you very much involved in their equivalent of a union when you were there? There wasn't an equivalent of a union and there still isn't really. How was the social life organised? It was organised around the college, you see, this is the point. Mm. Being a, a collegiate system in the sense that we are not at all. I mean, small residential colleges. Um, the social life 
centered uh, around the colleges. There were debating societies, there were political societies, there were all sorts of societies, but there was not a union that provided all of that for the whole of the university. The do, there are aspects of your life which we don't hear very much about because you're a cellist, aren't you? Well, I was a cellist long ago, it's so long ago now that I can say I, I could give pleasure to some people who listen to me. But you're but, a, a general all-round musician, aren't you? Uh, well, I was very active in my young days um, as a schoolboy and as a student and for some years afterwards. Because you had, your, uh, you had a choir at one time. Well, I, I was one of the pioneers at Harwell, the atomic energy establishment. And um, uh, one of the thing, little things I did at Harwell was to start uh, a choir and an orchestra. And we did a number of things and I conducted them and that was enormous fun. On a slightly different note, you went to Bow. You went to Brighton with Bow on Sunday, didn't you? Oh yes. Can you tell us something about that? Well, it was exceedingly enjoyable. Um, the only trouble was that uh, I was wearing rather a thick coat that turned out not to be at all waterproof. And for the last uh, hour and a half, we were completely drenched, and it felt rather like wearing um, a wet compress. But fortunately, uh, I had a bottle labelled purified water. It was water that had been purified with the aid of whiskey. And uh, we got through all right without any bones broken and uh, reached Brighton not very early, but at least not dishonorably late. Finally, or almost finally, can I ask you something about the media at IC, or rather those three organizations that the Union classify publications? Do you have any opinion of what you see? Felix, Stoic, and such as it is IC Radio? Um, I'm an avid reader of Felix. Um, Stoic, I support, uh, at least to the extent of, uh, of appearing on it occasionally. Um, I haven't appeared on radio yet. Uh, that's their fault, not mine, perhaps. Um, I'm very keen on these things. Uh, I'm very keen on students being able to influence each other. Perhaps the fact that the Stoic and Felix makes it less necessary for union meetings. That's a thought we ought to think about. Oh, I agree. Um, I'm very keen on these activities. I think you are, if I may say so, all three of you, doing an increasingly good job each year. You Thank all you learn much. something from what went before you, and you all seem to add something to it. Can I ask you a very nasty question now? Do you have any ambitions for IC in the long term? Is there something you'd like to see it happen at IC? I would like to see Imperial College not very different from what it is now. I mean, that is to say, uh, an institution dedicated to producing essentially professional scientists and engineers, but, but on a broader intellectual base, and recognized as a great institution as MIT is in the States, mm -hmm. which is consulted by governments and others on major national issues to do with technology, obviously, and which also is recognized as a, a great European institution. And finally, do you have any ambitions for yourself? Only to be able to stay here uh, long enough to see that on the way. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Brown Flowers. Thank you very much. Thank you.